Welcome, welcome. It's our first event for our virtual conference week. Happy Monday morning. I'm excited you came here to spend this morning with us uh, because this is an awesome event that we have this morning. And we are going to have these events all week starting at 11 o'clock and starting at one o'clock. So um, all the topics are gonna be a little bit different, but all within the try this wheelhouse of trying to work together to knock West Virginia off the worst health lists. And I'm very excited that our very first guest this week is Dr. Mark Kukazella. Uh, he is an exceptional uh, friend of Try This. He's been with us a long time. Um, and he is a professor at West Virginia University and uh, specializes in a lot of things, I would say. But uh, today he's going to talk to us about pediatric diabetes um, and uh, how we can reverse this ongoing uh, problem that is facing West Virginia, where we're often toward at the top or towards the top of worst health lists for obesity, diabetes, heart disease, uh, but also um, that that problem also affects youth. And so uh, with with pediatric diabetes, we're seeing that that can obviously cause lifelong problems and, and how can we impact that along the way. Without further ado, uh, let's take a second to stretch because in Try This, we like to lead by example and be healthy and move a little bit when we're on meetings this long. So let's start out and we'll end with a little stretch too. So whatever feels good for your body, whatever you're able to do, if you wanna reach your arms up high and stretch out your arms. Uh, maybe if you've been on your computer this morning, you can roll your wrists a little bit, shake it out get your blood flowing a little bit. And with that, I'll let Dr. Mark Kukazella take it away. Thanks for being here, Mark. No, thank you, Brittany. And I hope everybody can hear and it's a privilege to be with Try This. Hold on a second. Let's do the share screen. Your share screen. I think, I, I mean, I've been with Try This from the first meeting and it was such an awesome, um, just a way to connect with people. I, I forgot when the first, it was probably like seven years ago when Kate Long started it. And it was probably my most enjoyable meeting medically and community-wide that I've ever attended because I just met so many really cool people from fields I knew nothing about. You know, like farming, you know, how to set up, you know, these, these community hubs of bringing local agriculture, you know, to, to people, like all the really cool things people were doing with, physical activity and trails and building trails. And, and um, I hope we all get back together in person because I, th I think the, the beauty of these meetings is just you go to lunch or you go to dinner and you just meet all these new people and you chat with them and, it, and you leave there with some hope. You know, I think we're all kind of in this world of despair with pandemic and healthcare and cost and people getting sicker, <laughs> you know, West Virginia not doing too well, but, but like we, we, we want to give you all hope and, and give people hope. So, so today my topic is pediatric obesity, but I, I want you to leave with, with a bit of hope that maybe with some working together, we can help flatten this curve because I mean, no kidding, the, the, the ongoing uh, escalation in pediatric obesity has no evidence of flattening. You know, and but we'll talk a little bit about why that is. If you have questions, throw them in the chat, um, and then at the end we can address them. And I'll have Brittany just chime in if something is really pressing. Someone wants to meet a pause. You know, this is informal. You know, but I'll go through slides. But again, like I want you to just sit back um, and take some of this in. And you know, I can make all these slides available to everybody. Um, and I think the stretching thing is important. I'm at a stand-up desk now, and it just feels good to stand up and move. I, I think your brain works a little better. You know, we're all just bombarded with so much stuff. You know, so objective is, you know, about pediatric obesity. What do we know? What do we think? What do we have no clue? You know, there's a lot we need to learn about pediatric obesity. And whenever you give talks, you have to give your disclosures. You know, are you funded by everyone? But my main disclosure about pediatric obesity is I still have a ton to learn about this topic. Um, we have an ongoing uh, clinical trial now that we're already learning some tremendous things from uh, by enrolling these children in a 12-month clinical trial here at WVU for pediatric obesity. You know, big question is why do children become obese? We, we don't know the answer. If we knew the answer to this question, then it'd be pretty simple, but we don't. But this is 19, you know, early 19, I'm going to minimize this here, but 1971 or whenever the 74, um, this is an important nutritional disease 
and prevention is the only way out of it. And this is 1974. You know, um, we haven't come up very far since. And these are the statistics that just kind of scare us, right? These are the obesity rates, you know, children, high school kids, you know, and, and we're anywhere between number one and number four, depending on which, which survey, but it's not good. You know, this is, you know, one out of every five children now is obese in, a, in our state, you know, at the early adolescent years. And actually yeah, there was a CDC report showing one, 28% uh, of these children now are already pre-diabetic and that's up from 11% 20 years ago. And that's a terrifying statistic. You know, this is high school students and you just look at which direction this is going over time. And then diabetes travels with it. So ultimately a lot of these children will become diabetic you know, as they're obese and then they get more insulin resistant and then, you know, 10, 20 years later, then they're diabetic, but there's the roots of the start in childhood, you know, and we look at, you know, peds, uh, you know, children and adults with, with obesity, this is going up in both groups. You know, if we can't solve the pediatric problem, we'll never solve the adult problem. This is far from a West Virginia problem. This is every region in the world. So, so pediatric obesity now is a bigger problem in even in developing countries than malnutrition. But you know, our, our part of the world, the Americas, is, is really worse than any other part of the globe, other than you know, South Pacific is pretty close. Um, a lot of obesity in the South Pacific. You know, so if you look at uh, you know, rise in cardiometabolic complications, so why do we care about diabetes, uh, pediatric obesity? It's really the, the cardiovascular issues down the road because these folks are at very high risk for early cardiovascular disease. And that's going to affect their life expectancy, work productivity. Um, this is looking at the rise in pediatric obesity in all of these global regions of the world. You know, it's, it's going up significantly in both developed and developing countries. A lot of the kids in developing countries have malnutrition and obesity in the same person, meaning they're getting a lot of very nutrient poor, highly calorie loaded foods without any essential nutrients, very protein insufficient, and they end up with all types of nutritional issues. You know, this is the Trust for America's Health Obesity Report. And, it, you know, we always kind of travel in this Appalachia region, you know, whether we're number one or number two, but, you know, all of these states, whether it's obesity, diabetes, stroke risk, um, but it also travels with poverty too. So there's a direct correlation between poverty and diabetes and obesity. And these are the groups that have a slightly higher percentage. So if you look at, you know, Native, uh, Native Americans, um, higher uh, African-Americans, higher rates of obesity, Latinx higher rates of obesity. You know, if you look at the, the groups that are greatly increasing, so the teen group is, is really troubling, quadrupling rates of obesity from the 70s to now. And that's only a couple generations that you're seeing these rates just go up like a skateboard ramp. You know, so children are, you know, are these, uh, as, as doctors, you know, we, we're always told kids are not just little adults, but there's a lot of similarities when you look at the physiology, especially how the liver is affected with the sugars between children and adults. You know, so here, this is kind of a try this thing, you know, so why are we connecting farmers? You know, people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health and treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. So maybe through try this, we can connect, you know, connect some of these dots. You know, Ben, I think many uh, try thisers actually went to this uh, big Southern Obesity uh, Summit, which we had in 2018 in Charleston, West Virginia. It was 16, 17 states show up. And I was the medical director of this meeting. And, and this didn't give me a lot of hope when everyone was taking the elevator, you know, but we left this meeting, you know, with, uh, so this was what was put out as our statewide plan at that time. And I, you know, I greatly challenged this with, you know, dozens of articles and emails like, no, we have to look at the science before we put this out into schools as the treatment for obesity. And maybe some of you out there, you know, have seen this and, you know, it's not all bad, but it's not a treatment for obesity. So like, okay, here's the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, give kids uh, five servings of fruit and vegetables, tell them to have two hours less of screen time, you know, get an hour of physical activity, no sugary drinks, and this will make pediatric obesity go away. Um, but okay, what are, what are they eating outside of this? Okay, so if they have their five servings of syrupy loaded canned fruit, which is often what's served in school, and they, they would count juice as a vegetable and ketchup as a vegetable, you know, it, it's not gonna work. Um, but this kind of ship sailed, it left as the state policy. And sure enough, um, we still have a lot of pediatric obesity. And I just try to connect the science. I don't have any 
political uh, dog in this fight or, you know, this is, I just try to like, we need to look at the science. So in this 5210, which is actually a nationwide program, it's a 270 page document. And this is the only paragraph about the scientific rationale. And this last sentence kind of says it all. Emerging science suggests fruits and vegetable consumption may help prevent weight gain. And when total calories are controlled, may be an important aid in achieving sustainable weight loss. You know, but to me, that's not enough to change policy. You know, that might create a hypothesis, but we need to test that hypothesis. And if the test doesn't confirm the hypothesis, you know, the hypothesis is wrong. You know, Rob Lustig is probably the world's leader in this space. He's a pediatric endocrinologist, has published about 400 papers, and um, he's worked with me on projects. So I texted him during this uh, conference and said, Rob, I'm trying to convince my colleagues the AAP 5210 will not reverse obesity. It's more complex than that. Rob, you're right, it won't keep working. So here we are today, I'm still working. And they actually did a, a study on this meth methodology, um, no significant improvement. So they actually did a test of this hypothesis and it didn't work. Um, so, I mean, I, am I a little bit like this chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the end is near, you know, so, so that, I mean, I'm really shouting this out that, you know, we, we need to address this. You know, and then the, the media is not an ally. So, so in the media, this Washington Post, you'll get something like this. Eating too many eggs can still be risky, but most people don't have to give them up entirely. So, so I would, I'd like to ask that author, okay, what about eating eggs is risky, you know, or can still be risky, but it's setting the stage that eating the eggs are risky, which actually are a nutritionally complete food. And our grandparents ate these by the dozens before there was obesity. And now we have a lot of cereal with sugar um, and there's a lot of obesity. So I think, I think the eggs are okay, but do your own homework on that. You know, I've testified twice on the Senate floor about the dietary guidelines. Um, and the dietary guidelines, most of you out there probably doesn't affect your life, but it does affect what kids eat in school. So every five years they come up with the new dietary guidelines and these are driven by the Department of Agriculture. Really, they're not a, there's a scientific advisory, but it's, it's not really driven by any type of health entity. And um, you know they still push. You know if you read all of their ways of eating, they contain 60% carbohydrates. Now, if you look at our population, where you know overweight or obesity is at least 60%. You know I made the case that these dietary guidelines are not suitable for the proportion of our population that has overweight and obesity. So we need to have caution. Just putting these out to all is a healthy way of eating, you know, less than 40% of Americans would be considered well enough to eat this way and, and not have adverse effects. You know, and I was also in another policy meeting and um, left pretty distressed. So 2017, I was at the DHHS and there was a number, it was like a big think tank um, group, the AAP, which are pediatricians, CDC, public health, nursing, you know, all, all kinds of folks that were in the policy space of pediatric obesity. And I was the American Academy of Family Physicians representative. And uh, there was a, a lady there who ran a pediatric uh, bariatric surgery center, which to me is kind of a, ter a terrifying thought, just the sound of it. Um, but, but, you know, that's why we're in the room, right? It's a safe place, let's discuss things. But she was uh, describing how difficult it was to get insurances to cover the pediatric bariatric surgery. And if you're listening and you don't know what that is, that's called a gastric bypass. That would be uh, taking a 17 year old and taking out their intestines and um, hoping that they lose weight. So there are times where that's indicated, but it's, it's pretty extreme intervention. But she said this, well, we put the kids on this extreme diet for four weeks before the surgery and the surgery becomes safer. They lose 10% of their body weight and almost all of their liver fat. And I was like, oh, so I kind of raised my hand in the back. I was pretty quiet this whole meeting. And I, you know, I asked her respectfully, I said, you know, ma'am, you know, can you tell me about this extreme diet? And she's like, oh yeah, they eat meat, eggs, cheese, a lot of vegetables. Kind of paused. It's like, isn't that what we want kids to eat? And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of comment after that, but I actually looked up the study, you know, that she was referring to. So four week uh, ketogenic diet before bari bariatric surgery. These surgeries are risky because their livers are so big. They have so much adiposity. These are really risky surgeries. You know, these are not lower surgical patients, but what they found, you know, surprisingly in the description of this study was they liked the diet and they were not hungry. 
So if you're out there listening, okay, they lost 10% of their body weight, almost all their liver fat, they're eating real human food, they're not hungry all the time, and they like the diet, what would strategy A be? Maybe continue on the diet. <laughs> but that was uh, my thought. Um, yeah, childhood obesity, soaring to new levels. Um, this is a med page today, which is kind of a big publication. And uh, the, the authors of what's called the pediatric obesity algorithm wrote this editorial and they're talking about more beans, high fiber fruits, whole grain breads as, as the path. These are the authors of the document, which is the, this is the standard of care document comparing the ways of eating for pediatric obesity. So the only way in their own document that's ever been shown to help kids with obesity is a carbohydrate restricted diet, right? Weight loss is moderate to good, lowers fasting, insulin, triglycerides. So out of all these ways of eating, the low carb way is the only one that works. But yet the people who wrote this document when writing an editorial to the lay press didn't promote it. So I'm, I'm just kind of confused there. Um, they say, well, adherence to the diet is 50%. I mean, you're listening. To me, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, yeah. Wow, half of the kids could stay on this diet. Half of the kids could stay on this diet and it makes them better and it's real food. So maybe we need to rethink our public messaging here. So these are all of the major organizations that that treat or not treat that teach doctors. You know, the Academy of Pediatrics, CDC, National Heart and Lung Blood Institute, these are all these organizations that create guidelines, and not a single one of them are promoting carbohydrate reduced. They're saying whole grains, low fat, whole grains, lower fat, you know, and, and I'm wondering where the evidence is. And I've pulled up these documents, and they don't, they're, they're consensus opinion papers. And, and I think you all know what that is. A consensus opinion paper is where you have, you know, a group of thought leaders decide what the consensus should say. And if there's not a dissenting opinion in that consensus, then the consensus always agrees that what the consensus thinks is always right. So we need some dissenting opinions. And maybe I'm a dissenting opinion. You know, so this is my own uh, AAFP Family Physicians website, type 2 diabetes. In youth, whole grains, fruits, um, low fat yogurt. So, I, you know, I, I have a type of diabetes that doesn't make insulin. And as well as my type two patients, you know, if they eat whole grain breads and fruits, their sugars go off the rails because these are still carbohydrates. You know, these can have a place in a well person's diet, but if you're not well, you probably can't handle these foods. Type two diabetes in children, the word carbohydrate not even mentioned once in the article. Type two diabetes is a problem of carbohydrate intolerance. I mean, at its root, without carbohydrates, there is no type two diabetes. Type one, you don't make insulin. Type two, you're actually making too much and you're resistant. You know, it's driven by the carbohydrate. So to reverse type two, prevent type two, we need to stop the fuel, which, which is the carbohydrate. You know, so here's, this is I think important and why maybe some of you are in the room. So there's this big treatment void in pediatric obesity. There's effective therapies, which have high risk. That's called a gastric bypass. You know, yeah, so, so it works, it, they lose weight, but there's all kinds of downstream, including psychologic and psychiatric complications from this. And then there's telling people lifestyle, eat less, exercise more, you know, 5210, just things like that. You know, they, they, they're probably no downside to that, no harm, but, but they're not effective. So we need something that's actually effective without a downside, without a high cost, without high risk. And maybe that's the role for carbohydrate reduction. Because one thing that we know for sure, you know, whether it's a child or an adult, but especially in children, you know, if we suggest anything that makes these folks hungry, what are they going to do? They will eat. Eat. So try to suggest to a child, and kids are being told this all the time. I see kids and we're enrolling these kids. They'll go to clinic and they're told to stop eating when they're 80% full or something like that, or, you know, count calories or strict calories. And these kids are, you know, breaking into the fridge at night. They are hungry. They are hungry. So, I mean, many of you uh, listening now have been hungry before. <laughs> and if you are hungry, you will eat. So we need to figure out how to not make these kids hungry. And that's the role of protein. Protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So, but it's the most expensive macronutrient too. So again, that's a, that's a challenge for all of us. How do we get high quality protein in these kids, you know, w without breaking the bank, you know, and in places where they shop at the dollar store. 
you know, this was crazy too. You know, like I was, I'm 55, right? When I was a, a kid, we'd hop into the car. We didn't have seat belts. Certainly didn't have cup holders. But but now, I mean, the everywhere kids go is basically a, a virtual cafeteria. Whether they go to the movies now or in there, this car has 19 cup holders. You know, you got a cup holder for the juice and another one for their snacks. Then you got the TV screen. So we're just setting up our environment now just to be constantly eating, constantly snacking. You know, COVID-19, you know, what's this done for pediatric health and obesity? Not good. You know, this is Austria. You know, the sound of music hills are alive. These kids actually move more than the U.S. And you look at their cardiorespiratory fitness and their BMI is going the wrong direction. And we're seeing the data start to emerge from the U.S. now. You know, this is L.A., Casa Permanente. You know, the it's, it's going up, going up, going up uh, during pandemic. That's not even including their mental health, but their physical health is declining. Um, I wrote an article a couple of years ago with Nina Teicholz, you know, is it time to lock down sugar? You know, we had an opportunity two years ago, as we saw people with poor metabolic health were getting bad COVID. I was working in the hospital here. You know, if we were to really focus on policy, sure, develop vaccines and, you know, public health mitigation strategies of masks or whatever the narrative was at the time, but we, no one wanted to take on, well, we need to create healthier people who are healthier hosts because healthy hosts don't get as sick. But, but that, that didn't take, we don't, I don't think we spent a nickel in public health policy on trying to create healthier humans. You know, instead we sent them home with bag lunches, which just had horrible food in it. You know, when can we uh, address this and fix it? You know, so the earlier you can intervene and get a child on a normal growth curve, the better their odds of being a normal weight adult. So if you reach adolescence, obese, overweight, your odds of becoming a normal weight adult are 6%. You know, so it becomes much, much more difficult later on. You know, we have to address this early. And it seems like I did a, a you know, big deep dive into the literature as we prepared for our study here. You know, age six tends to be, you know, and you're like, wow, age six. But, but kids who are obese at age six, the children go through different phases of growth and what we call adipocytes or the fat cells. So they can multiply and they can expand. So the time these adipocytes are multiplying are kind of those periods of rapid growth, you know, so the age four to six and then the adolescent years. So, so when kids are on this, this really uh, high trajectory of obesity in that pre-age six, it kind of sets, sets their set point. And we don't understand fully why, but we know it's really difficult when kids are really obese at age six to reverse it. And that's a time where the kids really have no, you know, they have no say or play into what they eat, right? So this has to come down to policy because kids, you know, they, they, they can't choose their food, right? Uh, they're, they're not overeating and exercising too little. They're six years old. So it's not their willpower flaw. You know, so you can't blame the kid when they're obese at age six. There's more going on. You know, acceleration of BMI, early childhood, risk of sustained obesity. Again, the, the literature is just overwhelming that early intervention and er, you know, early risk is, sets, sets them up for a lifetime of obesity. And maybe some of you in, in the room now listening, you know, struggled with obesity when you were really young. And, and you know that for you, this is really, really hard uh, to make any headway in your weight. Um, you know, adult class two, class three obesity, you know, 80% of children um, with severe obesity will remain obese adults, you know, so it's, it's it sets the course, but it, obesity really is not the problem, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan, I don't like BMI, because it really doesn't tell me anything, it's a marker, you know, that maybe we can look for some other things, it's more of these other illnesses that we see later in life, specifically the cardiovascular and the GI, the fatty liver disease. These are the ones that you know, we're really seeing now. Like we used to think cardiovascular disease was an adult disease. Now, now we're seeing early stages of atherosclerosis in, in teens. And some of these are just done on autopsy studies. You know, when a child dies of some other accident, you look at their arteries, you're like, wow, these kids have, have atherosclerosis already. Um, fatty liver disease, you know, we're seeing, seeing this in kids now in middle school. And um, we used to call it, uh, uh, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because we start seeing children see what looks like alcoholic family liver uh, fatty liver disease. Now it's called metabolically associated fatty liver disease because it it's more about their whole metabolic state. Um, later on, we're seeing uh, musculoskeletal issues. You know, I work in an orthopedic clinic. You know, we see a lot of osteoarthritis. 
and we're working on patients to reduce their body weight to make those um, operations safer. A lot of psychological issues too, you know, when the kids were enrolling in this trial, you know, we're seeing, I mean, these kids are, you know, their self-esteem, you know, they're being picked on, you know, so that's a big deal in, in children. You know, more and more kids being diagnosed with diabetes type one and type two. We're not quite sure what's going on with the type one, but it's going up. Um, you know, just more and more, I'm not gonna go through all of these slides, you know, just more and more about data. You know, you can look at these slides later, you know. So, you know, I had a little bit of hope, you know, I've been around a while. So Michelle Obama came in the White House 2008 and her mission was pediatric obesity, right? That was gonna be her, her focus area in eight years in the White House. And she created a program that, that ended up being called Let's Move. And when I heard that right away, I was like, well, I, I think we've missed the opportunity because right there, the public's perception was kids need to move more. And it was highly supported and funded by big food, by food industry. There were a lot of sponsors of this, but basically to the general population, if you hear Let's Move, the problem or kids just need more PE class or something like that. But ounces are lost in the gym, pounds in the kitchen. So we saw that this did not, uh, wasn't with ill intent or poor motivation. I think the motivation was correct, but what we are all influenced tremendously by these conflicts of interest. Big food and big pharma really run the show. You know, the rest of us are trying to joust at windmills. Um, okay, so what does work? This is hard, right? So the only things that have been shown to bend this curve a little bit are these really multi-component behavior interventions. And these aren't things that can be applied massively to a population like West Virginia, you know, where you probably got 20 to 30% of the kids now needing something like this. You know, these are take a ton of manpower, a ton of resources. Some are even inpatient, you know, right, right now, like you can't even get kids to a doctor's. You know, so Cochrane reviews, you know, more questions than answers. No one's come up with the answers. We just, every time we look at the data, it, it just creates more questions. You know, and parents now too, you know, you see this throughout the state. We've kind of just become kind of inert to this because now like it, it's kind of normalized, you know, obesity because, you know, parents have it, kids have it, you know, maybe half the people in the healthcare office have the same problem. So we don't really view it now as a problem. So no one wants to really intervene, you know, they're kind of in and out of there, same stuff happens, you know, make sure their immunizations are up to date, you know, and is that anyone's fault? You know, really no, because to really, you know, stop the train and address this, you got to have an intervention that works and it takes a ton of time and resources. So if you're in a rural clinic in West Virginia, you know, seeing a child every 15 minutes as a doc and you're expected to address this problem with no resources, like there's no way you just, just pass go because you, you can't do it. You know, again, we have to work better together. You know, attrition is is huge. The majority of these these patients drop out of these treatment programs because, you know, it's it's harder. Maybe they're not getting the right. I don't know why they all drop out, but but they they drop out. You know, it's lack of social support. So so in our pediatric trial, the family has to engage. We can't have the family saying we're going to eat this one way, and little Jimmy, who's age eight, you know, having chicken breast and vegetables, and the rest of the family is having McDonald's. You know, that's not fair to little Jimmy. So, so they need to have that social support. You know, junk food, you know, is, is that the smoking gun, the junk food? You know, may, maybe, maybe not. You know, uh, poor diets, you're seeing Wall Street Journal talk about this now. You just watch what kids eat. You know, more than half of what Americans eat that would be term, termed ultra processed. And these are pretty much anything in a box or a bag is some ultra processed food. You know, folks will accuse me of being like, you know, a, you know, anti-carb, like, but no, no, I'm not anti-carb, I'm anti-junk food. You know, if you go back a few generations, this is carbohydrates and otherwise well people were vegetables, fruits, root vegetables, legumes, nuts, that's all fine. But now most carbohydrates that people have, you know, are chips and cereals and, you know, all, all the stuff, uh, you know, packaged muffins and all, all of that, refined grains. You know, trends in ultra processed foods, you know, there was an article this past summer, you know, they're estimating, you know, about 67% of the foods that teens eat is this ultra processed food, you know, but really, if you dig deep into the study, it actually shows you more than this. So the, the stuff they considered real food, I would probably consider processed. So they considered, you know, white flour, pasta, white rice, 
peanut butter and a lot of the peanut butters they have now are like Jif. There's added oils and added sugar, canned fruits they consider real food. But to, to your liver, a lot of these things behave the same as the processed food. So really 90% of what kids are eating now might be considered junk food. You know, that, that white Wonder Bread is totally different than something your grandmother would have made, you know, out of some really fresh grain that would have gotten stale in six hours. That's why everyone ate it really quick because it was delicious, but different types of flours. You know, increasing trend consumption of calories from ultra processed sweet, sweet snacks. I don't think that's surprising to any of us. Uh, this was from the authors too. We need to identify and evaluate strategies to reduce the added sugars. You know, just, yeah. So the the companies just push this out, advertising, watch the Super Bowl. This is no surprise to any of you. And um, when you eat these ultra processed foods too, they trick your brain. This is a study by Kevin Hall. So. The total calorie intake when people were allowed to add libidum, real food versus these ultra processed foods was about 500 calories a day, meaning your brain just says, I, I, I need to keep eating. Like, but when you don't eat the ultra processed food, somehow your brain decides I don't need to eat anymore. You know, that's, you know, called the gut brain axis. You know, there's all these, it's not calories. There's all these neurohormones and peptides that say, okay, I'm full. I don't need to keep eating. And that gets hijacked by the processed food. This is what we were serving children during the pandemic, chocolate milk, you know, which has six teaspoons of added sugar. This was the fruit. You know, you couldn't get fresh fruit. So that's just basically all sugar. Look at the types of cereals. These were given out by our own school districts. And it's not the school district's fault. This is allowed by the state. And you know, there's like Lucky Charms. I think that's, uh, you know, Cocoa Puffs, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It's just crazy, isn't it? And they get these juice boxes, sugar, 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 sugar. The dentists were just in distress seeing all that. Yeah, so advertising, it's all targeted to kids and, and especially the minority kids, the kids with less, uh, less privilege to buy better food. They're targeting them even more. Agricultural subsidies, subsidies are, are usually given to big ag and, and food that does not promote human health. You know, is it just the sugar, Gary Taubes? I spoke at Try This, uh, if any of y'all came to that. We had a Try This medical conference maybe four years ago and Gary came and, and was our keynote speaker. So we, I went, uh, this is pre-pandemic, I had a, a grant and we went into the schools and just surveyed kids. You know, it was great. We just had them in the room and we would just give out these little kind of fun, colorful handouts and they would answer these questions. Did, did uh, you drink any fruit juice or sweet drinks? You know, how many servings? You know, 40% are getting three plus servings a day. These are elementary school kids. Um, kids develop an innate preference for this sweet taste also. You know, the, the earlier they are, the, the more that part of their brain just develops this, this uh, drive to eat more of it. Um, so if you have kids, keep them away from all those juices and sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners too have similar effect as to the brain. So the brain just loves this stuff. You know, go back, you know, and this isn't really that long ago in the history of human existence. So 1750, you know, there's houses in this in these counties that were built in 1750. You know, you go out into the rural areas, you know, four pounds per year of, of sugar. And now it's uh, 40 times that, you know, I don't think we've really made that adaptation as a species to, to do that. Here's a soft drink intake, you know, from 1955 you know, to, to uh, 2005, up, 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 up. You know, these are gallons per person. You know, this is what happens to the liver. So, so the, the soft drinks, in the, which would include also the juices, the fructose has this really negative effect on the liver. And that'd be for another talk, but diabetes really starts as liver insulin resistance. So, so the fructose needs to go directly first pass in the liver. So even you take an equal amount of uh, juice carbohydrate versus you know, maybe even some bread, uh, the juice is gonna behave worse worse than, than the bread to your liver. You know, so just some more articles, nine days you can reverse fatty liver disease just by getting rid of the sweet drinks. And this isn't even carbohydrate reduction. This is just getting rid of the drinks. You know, they could have pizza and bagels, just get rid of the drinks. You know, fructose, fructose. Yeah, so we're seeing this everywhere now. It just starts that fat accumulation in the liver and we're seeing this in the kids now. They've all they they do fibro scans, and, and these kids already have you know fairly advanced fatty liver disease. All right, yeah. What are kids doing now? More than half of toddlers drink fruit juice as their only beverage 
in any given day. And I, I think we see some of this in, in our state because the water quality in many places is pretty poor. Um, so people are going to dollar store using their snap and buying these you know, big things of juice and the kid prefers the juice over water. You know, so they're drinking a lot of juice, um, not good for their livers. You know, the AAP actually uh, came in and, and now has put kind of a recommendation for less fruit juice. You know, generational rise. You know, when, when I was a kid, we had these things called juice glasses. They were, they look like shot glasses. They're these little glasses. And now juice glasses are like these monster glasses. You have packaged foods. You know, if you go down that baby food aisle or that toddler aisle in the grocery store, you know, 100% of these, these desserts have added sugar. And even the things that, you know, I kind of, the term I use is called like greenwashing. You know, the front of the package will have like organic or something or, you know, whole grains or real juice, but, but they're added sugar. So the front of the, the package should always be a warning label, flip to the back um, and look at what's actually in there. You know, 20% of the calories of many of these foods is just added sugar. Homeschool environment, this is from our survey too. You know, almost all of these kids have sodas, sports drinks, snack chips at home. You know, so the, our, home, our home food environments are not really safe. You know, most of us have gotten, you know, if you want your kid not to smoke cigarettes, you're not leaving cigarettes around. But if, you know, if we want kids not to eat and drink this stuff, and you're a parent, you just can't have this stuff around because they will eat it and drink it. Certainly if the parents eat it and drink it, they will eat it and drink it. You know, screen time, you know, double disaster is probably sweet and drinks and screen time, you know, so I, I believe physical activity has a huge role. Um, when the two toxins are together, it's really negative. Got maybe 10 more minutes. I'm just gonna fly through a few things, you know, that kind of attach some of the history. You know, what do kids eat in school? You know, so, 1900, you know, pre, uh, pre-war, you know, basically there's, if you go to this website here, you, you see all these pictures of through the years, what kids ate in school. And I got to interview, uh, a lady who ran the Harpers Ferry middle school school, um, lunch program before she retired, like in the 1990s, she retired, she's in her eighties now, but she said prior to 1980, when the U S government came in, what happened in schools was, you know, if her name was Mary and, and if, she, if it was her day, to be the lead, she would make, you know, Mary's chicken pot pie or something. So it's basically a recipe that was in her family. They would just make it and serve it to the school. There weren't all these regulations. And then uh, when the government came in, now you couldn't add salt. They gave you whole wheat flour and the kids hated it. And you, you couldn't add any fat, you know, and the kids hated it. She said her own, her own kids needed to pack lunch. So, so they basically extracted that knowledge and that of these ladies and men maybe too that cooked for generations of school kids and then the government came in and uh, took it over and the results as we know from 1980 food pyramid to now you know in public health it didn't go well that experiment did, did not go too well but we keep now we change it from a pyramid to a plate but there really has been no really meaningful policy change in school food they still are allowed chocolate milks in school and all that stuff i showed you but she actually said this to me she said if they, this lady's like in her 80s and she's just still like sharp as a tack. She said, if they had left us alone, there would be no childhood obesity. She was pretty firm in that. So he's like 85 years old now. If they had left us alone, no childhood obesity. Picture from the 60s. Actually in the 70s, fast food was allowed access into the schools, you know, but, but that's been extracted, thank God. But this is what happens in school. So this is from um, one of our county's websites. Uh, so you can actually look up what the macros are so this is uh, free school breakfast and lunch, 141 carbs, 19 protein, lunch, 89 carbs, 35 protein. You know, then they go home to pizza and probably some more sweet drinks. So, so to a child's little kindergarten liver, you know, there's, they can't handle this. This is a ton. This is not a nutrient dense way of eating 230 grams of carbs just with breakfast and lunch. You know, then the kids might grab some seconds. There's still vending machines in the schools. Now they don't let kids use these during school hours, but after hours, the kids can go use these vending machines. You know, they say uh, healthy snacks inside. This is, I don't see anything healthy in that vending machine. <laughs> it's like Mountain Dew, it's crazy. Um, we're pushing things nationally like meatless Mondays. But if you actually look at a child, a child needs animal protein, you know, for 
adequate growth, you know, unless you're going to really supplement the heck out of this child because B12, iron, vitamin D, you know, these things are, travel with the a animal products, you know, and again, I don't have any, I'm thinking scientifically here, if someone has a religious or moral reason, you know, not to have any animal products, they can do that, but, but they need to make sure they're getting, they have to supplement, they have to make sure they're getting the complete proteins, B vitamins, zinc, iron, all of these things. So, so again, that may that might not be the best idea. I would I would propose sugar-free Mondays and sugar-free every day of the week. Maybe maybe that might help us out and actually you know bend the bar a little bit. Bariatric surgery in kids. We talked a little bit about that. You know that's an extreme. I, I don't think eating plants and animals is extreme. I think doing this is extreme to a child. And the people that do these surgeries, you know, they they make their own consensus statement. So they should be considered standard of care. It, do, do you all know what standard of care is? That's like first line, standard of care. So I disagree that doing this to a child is standard of care. And I'll, I'll take that one, you know, again, to the argument floor and state my case. And that's why we have discussions. You know, I don't think it should be standard of care. You have mental health problems persist. You know, that you, you create malnutrition. If you take a child or an adult's intestines out, you know, your small intestine especially is essential for absorption of multitude of micro and macronutrients so, so we end up i see a lot of these patients in clinic you know after gastric bypass and we've got to you know you have to draw half their blood volume every year to test for all the vitamin and mineral deficiencies and then supplement it all it gets very complicated um, so it's, it's not an easy solution robert lustig obesity is a metabolic disease this is a really good book to read i'm not i'm just going to go to some of the uh, interventions now for pharma and and uh, exercise, a little bit about exercise. So weight loss medications, we'll just hit this one really quick. So pharm this is a kind of review article, pharmacologic treatment of pediatric obesity. You know, the slide is intentionally blank. There was no, the only one that they actually approved was one called Orlistat, which makes you not absorb fat. <laughs> so if you eat a lot of eat fat, it makes, it creates all these oily stools, but there was really, it was like 2%. Uh, BMI reduction, something, but then it's like loaded with side effects. And then they're not absorbing the fat soluble vitamins. Milks, so uh, low fat milk compared to the real milk your grandmother had. If you actually look at the literature, the kids who drink the real milk have less obesity. Um, why we're still giving skim milk in school, I, I don't know why. And, and kids hate the skim milk because it doesn't taste good. So then we add chocolate and strawberry syrup to it. So Exercise. So, you know, I've, I've done exercise sessions that try this and I love it, you know, like getting people out and running and moving and doing fun things with kids. We build trails. We have a nonprofit here that builds trails at school. So this is great for kids, great for their brains, gets them outside. You know, exercise is wonderful. You know, fitness and body mass index. The kids, I don't know if it's causation or just association. Kids with very high fitness tend to have less obesity. Um, it's all good, right? Like, you know, it's like the diet is king and the exercise is queen and together you have a kingdom. So, so I would stay away from arguing either or which is better. I think anyone out there listening to this who's living a healthy life, you kind of know, like, yeah, if you take, I love to run every day. It's my mental health therapy. But if you took away my run in the morning, I'd be pretty miserable even eating a healthy diet because it does good things for me. Um, it is addictive, you know, in a good way, you know, exercise, dose, diabetes, risk, yeah, and, and this is this was actually good because this uh, exercise intervention had 94% retention versus a lot of the nutritional interventions. Kids, if they don't like what they're eating, they just drop out. But the focus on this was kind of like our try this focus, make it fun, make it play. You know, yeah, this is what we want. Like this isn't regimented, take the kid and, you know, put them through an hour CrossFit workout if they don't like CrossFit. You know, no, just make them go out and be kids run around just what do you want to do keep them moving keep them moving i'd really recommend these couple books about fitness uh, spark is a wonderful book john rady and then just let the kids play um, bob bigelow and and anyone who's into coaching now or has a kids a kids in organized sports this kind of shows a lot of what's gone wrong in in youth sports now now you have parents signing their kids up for travel leagues at age six hoping for college scholarships so we're kind of tearing kids into these single sports really early in life and then they learn to hate it you know we just wanted kids to just play and, and then they actually develop you know into you know full ability athletes just multi-sports different seasons have fun have breaks and then they can go on 
with that. Um, low carb for kids, you know, so again, this is really where the evidence is, but people have a bias against thinking that this stuff is, is dangerous for them in some way. Um, Duke now is using this intervention, you know, first line, you know, I called them and they said, yeah, there were often every child coming into our childhood obesity clinic, this as if they want to do it, they call it the advanced option, but they're offering it to everyone because it's the, the best one. And if they're ready to do it, they'll do it. Um, yeah, we, we've been using this method for epilepsy treatment in children for decades, and, and it's highly effective without really any downside. These kids don't have problems when it's done done well, you know, when, when someone helps them do this right. Uh, Dr. James Bales in Huntington, he's my partner in our trial. He wrote a book on this almost 20 years ago. He uses low carb for his kids. He's a pediatric endocrinologist. He's published in this space. You can read his articles. You know, yeah, when kids adhere to the diet, they they have like significant meaningful weight change. You know, it's about 40% adherence, which to me is actually pretty good. He doesn't have a whole team of people, you know, coaching these folks. You know, he's trying to do this on the fly in his clinic. You know, some more of his studies. You know, I'm just going to kind of stop there. Um, if any of y'all, because we're at 11:50, then we can do questions. Yeah. So if any of y'all have any children that you think might be eligible, just contact me. Um, you know, hope for the future. Yeah, so gosh, we double snap at our farmer markets, farm to school. It's another great program. Yeah, get your farmers involved. Yeah, that's that's all I got for you. Um, 11.50, we did okay. So <laughs> I know that's it's a big topic. I, I like, so if I tweaked your interest a little bit here to read more about it, then, then do it and reach out to me. If, if I can help you at all with any resources. It's controversial, but that's why we're here is share the science. And we're trying to learn from everything, you know, I've learned is that I've learned from my patients. So yeah, that's, I, that's why we, we do research is, and we do, we practice medicine, right? We're practicing every day. We're kind of learning what's working and what's not working. But I know I kind of I kind of went at one one point five speed there. You know, if you're used to listening to podcasts, you know, so maybe one point two five, one point five speed. So apologize if ran through that, but we have an hour. But questions, yeah. So maybe go to I'll go to the chat here. Brittany, yeah, Mark. Any ones that you want to kind of instead of me scrolling through that you want to kind of pull up? Yeah, uh, can you drop your and, email in the chat, Mark, so that folks have yeah, it too? Yeah. And we'll send all this and out after can, the fact uh, as well. People can unmic too, like if you want to just unmic and just, uh, I don't know if you need to raise your hand, I don't know that. Oh you no, you can just hop off mute. I, I wanted to say one thing while folks think of their questions. I ran out, you said, oh, all the things look healthy and they're green in the store and my uh, my nephew is seven and he is a sugar fiend, you know, like before he came to live with us, that's was primarily what he was eating all the time. And so trying to get him to love other foods has been quite a challenge. He's a real picky eater. And I got these things given to me, like these little go-go squeezes, right. Oh, that are all green much, and have the happy sugars little... in it. Yeah. Flip the back yeah. Of the pack and so my favorite thing about nutrition facts is it never has like a percentage of how much sugar you should have so this is 70 Total calories grams. yeah and how many grams of carbs 70 calories but it's 13 grams of sugar and what they're supposed to like recommendation is like 25 tops so it's yeah, more than it's, half of his sugar for the day all sugar there's yeah not, i bet there's one gram of protein in there uh zero yeah zero. so it's 16 yeah, so grams it's all carbs no is the protein. only thing in here yeah so uh, you're no right nutrition. about that. There's yeah. absolutely nothing that's going to help that child's you know, yeah. sustainable <laughs> development. That's and that's good. actually a good point when you when you flip a label. You know, if, if there's more carb than protein, it's probably not going to make you full because we need the protein. We need essential amino acids. That's the building blocks for cellular repair. So carbs can give us energy. Fats can give us energy, but we need protein for cellular maintenance. So if you like you pick up a low fat yogurt, it's going to have 28 grams of carbs, five of protein. But if you go get a plain yogurt, plain Greek yogurt from Aldi, it'll have six grams of carbs, give or take, and it'll have like 13 of protein. You know, so you always want more protein than carbohydrate, mostly for like, I mean, for everything, for satiety, like you're not going to be hungry in an hour. Plus, that's what you need is the protein. Yeah, breakfast cereal, like no protein, 
all sugar. <laughs> and you wonder why the kids are pinging off the teachers, you know, drives them crazy, right? They're hungry again in like an hour. They're like, I need more sugar. Yeah. Um, can folks totally also English. drop drop their name and email and like organization in the chat if you haven't already? That way we can uh you know, keep track of who's here and what interest groups. Um, I know Sarah, you, I'm putting you on the spot, Sarah, you had a, a question about type one diabetes, right? I know your son has type one. Um, well, no, no question, just that I am passionate about spreading awareness and people knowing the difference between um, type one diabetes and amen. type two diabetes. Yeah, and in type one, you know, so I got a monitor sitting here on my arm right now. So, so I'm I'm on the adult type one spectrum. So, so eating low carbohydrate, like Dr. Richard Bernstein, the book's called The Diabetes Solution. So his cohort of children doing, you know, what he calls high protein, low carb, average A1C is five seven, and these kids are thriving. Type one grit is the Facebook page that all of these type one kids are on and the parents and there was a movie if you want to watch an amazing movie just type in the diabetes solution movie and watch the movie from uh, bethany mckenzie who has a son who's type one just about how like everything they originally learned was just disaster and then they found dr richard bernstein who's been, he's been diabetic type one since 1946 and he still goes to the gym and he became an endocrinologist to be able to treat himself because no one really would pay attention to what he was doing and i saw a thing in there that says is there too much protein no really it's it's the only time protein might be a factor if you have advanced kidney disease like you're like on like dialysis level kidney disease yeah there is a, a threshold of protein but if you're otherwise well there's no there's not been a single case report of people eating protein from real human foods that that amount of protein has affected the liver and this isn't like quote high protein it's just you're eating foods that prioritize protein you know so you're eating you know eggs and fish and meat and maybe some nuts and cheese, like those foods are good quality protein. We're not telling kids to, you know, just drink oodles of whey protein shakes and things like that. But just if the fats travel with protein, you know, real food. So it's, we eat real food. We're not thinking fat or protein, but an egg has fat and protein, you know, a piece of steak, fat, and protein, cheese, fat, and protein, but really no minimal to no carbohydrate in those foods. So those are great foods for type ones, because they can eat those foods, they get all the nutrient density, and their sugars are beautifully stable. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like I have a ton of type ones in my practice and teach them this and they're not on the roller coaster all the time, you know, their glucoses look, you know, look like mine do, they're just flat as flat. You know, and I'm not innate, you know, I'm not concerned about highs or lows, because it's all it's like flying a plane. Now you can see kind of what these things are. The problem with um, my, well, you know, he's 15, so that creates, um, yeah. you know, that's. Yeah, this is a stable sugar, so he's pretty stable. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so he's, he's, he doesn't have full control over what he eats, but he's got to learn that, right, because he goes to friends, but he'll learn it, because he's, he's transitioning, it's tough, because adolescents have to learn to become adults. You know, so Sarah, you've been able to control his food environment, but now he's 15 and he's going out with friends. So, but the kids, it's crazy. I, these kids really want to be well. Like they, I've seen kids 15, you know, type ones be able to go out, eat pizza with friends, but they just have the cheese. They put it in a skillet. They take the crust off and they enjoy their social time. But they don't have sweet drink and they're fine and they do great, but. He's getting better. I mean, we have um, the Dexcom and he's on the T-Slim. So, I mean, he we have pretty good um, awareness of what his blood sugars are at all times. Um, yeah, and you can track them because, you know, you can track you can track them on your phone so you can kind of see what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a little high right now. I want to hop on because on the follow. Yeah. It's been interesting because I've watched Sarah and Manny go through the whole process of figuring it all out. And she has really educated a lot of folks in the community about it. And there's like, <laughs> there's like a bubble around Manny at this point. Like there are so many people that are aware of what 
to look for the signs and can address it. And then he's also comfortable enough to come to us. So Sarah's done an amazing job with just as yeah. a parent, like really educating and the families and every, anyone that he's around. So I think that's been, uh, thank you, Sarah, because I mean, I've learned a lot just from watching you guys. And this is all just kind of like, oh yeah, I already knew that, but it's really it's a it's learning process. Like it's constantly learning. Heck yeah. If well, you thank you, day, Laura. You get back on track the next day, right? It's, it's fine. Whoops, made that mistake. Just don't keep making the same mistake again and again and again. Yeah, I got to the point where I always had something, or one of the parents during some of these sporting events always had something on them just in case he needed something. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's been fun and interesting to learn about it. And yeah, so Sarah, you've done an awesome job. I love my bubble. <laughs> We had another question in the chat. Any apps you suggest with help for recipes or monitoring? Yeah, I just shared dietdoctor.com is really good. There's like a thousand recipes. And there's a little little book that I, I wrote, which I give to patients, but you can download the whole book. So if you just go to tinyurl.com forward slash low carb any budget, we designed this book to be able to go into a dollar store and buy you know, foods that are low in carbohydrate for people with obesity, diabetes, prediabetes. So we have recipes in that book also. So there are a couple good resources to pick up. Question here, because um, then I got, I got a rock too. Yeah. Um, it says, what about a vegan diet? So there's a big, so a true vegan diet has absolutely no animal products. So, so, and then there's what's called like a lacto ovo vegetarian where you have cheese and eggs. So, so you have complete proteins, which are nine, all nine essential amino acids, and you have to get all of those in your food, right? Your body can't, you, your body can't make those. So, so the pure plant-based foods are not complete protein. So you have to be really smart if you have no eggs, no cheese, pure plants. The quality of the protein, no plants is a complete protein. So you've got to be really smart about mixing your proteins. Now, if you have eggs in addition to your vegetable, an egg is a complete protein. You've just, you're not a vegetarian as far as your biology goes, right? Maybe, you know, religiously or ethically, you think, okay, I don't want to eat any animals. But if you're eating eggs and cheese, you're good. You are eating animals nutritionally because an egg would become a chicken, right? An egg is the magic food. So if you're getting eggs in your body, you've covered a lot of bases. You know, these are mostly like B12, choline, you know, and then just having all of these, I mean, iron, you know, you need iron is, is going to be meats, mostly red meats. So you're going to have to need to, you're going to need to supplement if you're a vegan, because a supplement is what you're not getting in your real food. So, you know, unless you have a very specific reason to not have any animal products at all from religion or some other reason, you know, get some in your diet because we are human organisms, homo sapiens. And if you look at us, you know, just scientifically what we are, we are designed to eat, you know, mostly animal products as far as what's helped our human development and our brain and kind of how we got here, whether we're fished or hunted and started farming 10,000 years ago, you know, but, um, you know, I mean, our evolution is eating some degree of animal products and then gathering the rest of the stuff you need. But, you know, that's my opinion, but that's based on science of protein metabolism. So get your proteins, complete proteins. The 10 grams of peanut butter protein is not the same as 10 grams of protein in that egg, because the egg is a complete protein. You're going to have a full balance of amino acids good you're allergic to eggs so yeah it makes it difficult yes yeah, so you have allergies to things and you gotta yeah we all got issues yeah so each person has to and then they become their experimental one right like okay let me try this how do i feel my lab markers my blood sugars my body weight my exercise capacity so what works for one perfectly might not be the best path for someone else and when i see people in clinic there's not like one road to magic road to the to the kingdom or something everyone develops their own strategy based on their preferences for foods what their goal is um, we work with them and we try to help everybody all right well this has been fun thank you all for coming on thank you and, so uh, much mark have, um, a, have a nutritious lunch today <laughs> so, yeah yeah I'm gonna go eat some plants we're fast right <laughs> like you don't really need lunch yeah we didn't even talk about fasting yeah um but thank you so much for being here mark um always lovely to hear from you and you always uh inspire me to think of 
better ways to be healthy. So um, we appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. So thank you so much, Dr. Kukazella. We appreciate you. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Have a great one, everyone.